Welcome back to Paleo Talks. Good to be back here with you all and thrilled today to have with us Dr. Stephen Zhang. How are you doing, Stephen? I'm Blaine. How are you doing? Oh, great doing to join well. you. Great doing to join well. everybody. All right. Well, it's great to see you. It's been a while. You've been active on our on our show uh, remotely on Facebook, and that's been wonderful. Lots of great questions and comments and feedback. I think you've been our one of our biggest representatives in terms of helping us answer questions <laughs> to some of our audience. I try. <laughs> we appreciate that. We do. We do. Let's jump over to David now, and he'll remind everybody how the show works. Sure. So this is the standard Paleo Talks format. We're going to do an introduction here in a second and then go right into our guest presentation. Today, we're talking about elephants, uh, again, but a different type of elephants than we've been discussed previously on the, pod, on the, on the show. After the presentation is over, we're gonna start the Q&A section. So at that point, we're gonna ask the audience to start sending us their questions for our guest. When that time comes, we'll ask you to put your questions in the comments of the Facebook video. We'll be reading them from there. And as always, if for any reason you can't leave a comment on Facebook, you can head over to the Gray Fossil Site Twitter or Instagram account and send us your questions there. I'll be keeping an eye on those as well. All right, thank you, David. I'm Blaine Schubert, and we're coming to you from the Center of Excellence in Paleontology at East Tennessee State University, where we oversee the Gray Fossil Site and also do a lot of, uh, which is Pliocene, early Pliocene in age. And we also do a lot of uh, Ice Age level research and even up into the Holocene. Having Dr. Chris Widga with us again today. Hey, Chris. Hi, more yeah, proboscidean yes. talks. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Just the one more proboscidean talk. <laughs> Eventually, we're, you know, this well is going to run dry, but I'm enjoying it while it happens. <laughs> Eventually, we'll do a whole spin off show and it's just going to be all proboscidean. Just, just probos, yeah. Just probo <laughs> talks. I mean, you probo could talks. Easily just change it to probo talks. Seems... <laughs> Make proboscideans great again. That's what we need to do. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good. And uh, I think Stephen and I met originally at the IVPP uh, in Beijing when I was visiting over there and have gotten to know each other over these years. Uh, and I've, I've been to many of his talks, always fascinated to learn about what your research is, Stephen. Well, my research is. Yes, well, always. All, always thing, all things proboscideans. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the um, short one line answer, but... Um, more specifically, my uh, research has been focused on the um, taxonomy, evolutionary history, and paleoecology of late Cenozoic proboscideans. So um, Blaine will remember we met at IVPP when I was doing a um, master's project on um, the feeding habits of Chinese Pleistocene proboscideans as inferred from toothware. And, um, I, I'm still very grateful to um, Blaine to this day for having given, given me a hands-on demonstration of the um, sampling procedure. Ah, yeah, that's right. That's right. We were working on, <clears throat> was I doing some bears and showing you how that worked? You, you, you just sprayed a bit of um, blue gooey <laughs> stuff, whatever that's called, <laughs> on, the, um, on the cusp of one of the gonfothea molars I was trying to sample ah, from. That's right. That's right. Very good. <clears throat> well... Yeah, and, and it's been wonderful, I mean, over these years, learning about the different type of proboscidean uh, work that you're doing in different parts of the world. And, and Chris has many times commented on, on some of your projects as well. And so we're excited to have you on here today to That's learn more specifically uh, about these straight tusks, uh, specimens that you've been working on. And the way we like to start the show is, is to have you introduce yourself and sort of start though from the very beginning of how you got interested in paleontology and then sort of walk us through uh, where you went to university and where you're at today. Oof. So, um, <laughs> in one as minute, we, as we said before, um, I think the short one lined answer is that I never thought seriously enough about um, pursuing anything else. And um, so by the end of our third year doing the um, paleontology and evolution undergraduate course at um, Bristol, we all had to choose a, um, a dissertation research project to, to, to be able to um, 
graduates, so to speak. So you could choose one of the um, projects that was on offer or you could come up with your own. I had a look at the projects on offer and um, frankly um, didn't interest me that much. And um, in the meanwhile, I thought um, Chinese Pleistocene megafauna is a good opportunity to um, do something where there hasn't been a great deal of analytical work on. And so I, um, I came up with a project looking at um, foraging preferences in Chinese Pleistocene proboscideans, um, Asian elephants, stegodon, and um, one of the last of the gonfotheas called Sinomastodon. And that brought me onto my um, PhD, which has been on the um, taxonomy and evolutionary history of the true elephants, the um, lineage that includes um, the more immediate extinct relatives of the living of the living elephant species, the mammoths, and um, as well as the focus of our presentation today, Paleoloxodon or the straight tusked elephant. Very good. Sorry, that took a bit long. No, no, I was just teasing earlier about time. But uh, but now you're at Bristol, and and you have you have a position there that is uh, allowing I'm you to. I'm currently sort of in, in between positions. Okay, very good. But you have access to work on the, the collections there? Um, they don't actually have a large collection, but uh -huh. it's, been, um, it's been very useful actually to um, still have access to the literature to be able to um, just finish off projects that started during the PhD. Right. All right. Well, we will move forward then and go ahead and have you share your screen. I'll try to get this right. And Chris and David, if you have any questions as we're moving through this, please jump in and, and I'll do the same, Stephen. Sure. Should we get started? Yes, please go ahead and get started. Sure. So um, welcome to um, today's talk which is on the rise and fall of the um, extinct straight tusked elephants. Although um, I'd like to add that um, these elephants were simply more straight tusked compared to the really curvy tusked ones known as mammoths. Um, as I said to Blaine earlier, I wouldn't really trust um, whoever came up with the name straight tusked elephant to be building a bridge. So um, to begin the talk, we're actually starting with uh, the um, extinct elephants that everybody is familiar with, the mammoths, because um, recently, as you saw on um, Adrian Lister's talk a little while back, we had the oldest ancient DNA retrieved from um, mammoth populations in northeastern Siberia that were ancestral to both the woolly and Columbia mammoths. And from analyzing the um, ancient DNA of these early mammoths, we know that um, the ancestor of these mammoths in Africa interbred with the ancestor of Paleoloxodon. And that is part of a very intriguing story about the ancestry of these um, straight tusked elephants that I will delve into further on in this presentation. So um, today's talk will primarily be concerned with um, these three um, questions, um, Paleoloxodon or straight tusked elephants, who were they, how did they come about, and who's who among the Paleoloxodon? So um, at least um, the Europeans had known, um, had known the remains of um, Paleoloxodon since the sort of mid late 1600s when um, Wilhelm Ernst Tensel described um, the remains, the skeleton actually, of a long dead elephant found at um, Burgtona in Thuringia, Germany. I, unfortunately, I could not find an illustration of the Burgtona Paleoloxodon skeleton, but um, what I do have myself is a skeleton of the circus elephant Hansken now on display at the Zoological Museum in Florence, which um, Tensel compared his Burgtona skeleton with to establish that um, 
the, this was the skeleton of a long dead elephant. And later on, um, in the late 18th century, um, this chap on the um, top left corner, Johann Friedrich Blumenbach, referred to the um, Bogtona skeleton when he described um, Eliphaz primogenius, the, the woolly mammoths. And um, so, of course, those were early days. There were no rules regulating um, the definition of zoological nomenclature. And so you have this sort of unfortunate dead end situation where um, one name one name contains the remains of actually two species of extinct elephants. And this issue was only resolved in 1990 when paleontologists positioned the International Commission on Zoological Nomenclature to consider this um, woolly mammoth skeleton at the Zoological Museum in St. Petersburg to be the type specimen of the woolly mammoth. And so separating that hypodyme from the straight tusked elephant. And um, since Johann Friedrich Blumenbach um, named um, Eliphaz primogenius the woolly mammoth, um, several species of extinct elephants that we now consider to belong to the Paleoloxodon lineage have been discovered. You get Paleoloxodon nomadicus from the um, Indian subcontinent. You get Paleoloxodon nadriensis. This is a dwarfed insular species actually from the Nadra Gap in Malta. You also get Paleoloxodon antiochus from Western Europe and Paleoloxodon rekai, first described in 1915 from the um, Olduvai Gorge in Tanzania. And um, then you get Paleoloxodon naumani from Japan, which um, led the um, late Japanese mammalian paleontologist Matsumoto to coin the very name Paleoloxodon in 1924. And so these discoveries coincided with the um, first practice of um, phylogenetic hypotheses in, in paleontology. And um, one of the pioneers was um, the French paleontologist Albert Gaudry, whom um, I would consider to be the first evolutionary paleobiologist, not just because he drew the first hypothetical phylogenies of different mammal groups, but also he was the first to um, consider the way um, ancient animal assemblages interacted with each other and with their ancient environment. All this was done within his seminal treatise of the um, late Miocene um, Hipparian savanna ecosystem known from Pikemi, Greece as um, Jessica Theodore was talking about um, it last week about these ancient savanna-like ecosystems which resembled present-day Africa, but were once more common across Eurasia and North America. Anyhow, back to um, the elephants. Um, other scholars soon followed suit with different um, hypotheses about the relationships of um, Paleoloxodon, even though this was before the name Paleoloxodon even came up. Um, you had um, you had Zergo who thought of Paleoloxodon as descended from the um, southern mammoth known from the early Pleistocene of Italy. You had um, Paulich who thought um, of Paleoloxodon as closely related to the modern African elephants and um, Osborne in um, the 1930s more or less followed suit in his seminal monographic treatise of fossil proboscideans known at that time. And then the sort of prevailing opinion on the um, how Paleoloxodon came about sort of took shape in the sort of late 1970s to 1980s. First of all, you had the um, you had Vincent Maglio's monograph of elephant evolution, which cleaned up the um, ambitiously over-optimistic estimations by Osborne about the whole historical diversity of um, elephants. And Maglio sort of came up with the idea that and the ancestry of Paleoloxodon lies within 
this lineage of elephants that evolved in East Africa, known as um, the Eliphaz Rekai lineage. And um, this idea was later expanded upon by the um, by another French paleontologist, um, Michel Bedon, who divided the um, Rekai sort of complex into five successive chrono subspecies. And um, we'll talk about um, Rekai in a bit more. Rekai, as I said earlier, was first discovered by German paleontologists working in the Olduvai Gorge in Tanzania. They found this um, nice um, left half of a mandible with a molar. And on this lower molar, you can see some classic features of paleoloxodon. You get the um, dot dash dot enamel um, wear figure in early mid wear. And um, as you go into mid wear, the enamel figure sort of form this um, very beautiful, in my opinion, um, cigar shape with these um, pinched out sinuses that are a little bit reminiscent of the extent African elephant loxodonta. The um, name paleoloxodon actually means ancient lozenge tooth. And uh, subsequent to these early German discoveries, the um, French researchers discovered a bunch of um, elephant remains from the Omo Valley in southwestern Ethiopia that later turned out to predate the um, original Olduvai sample somewhat. But um, the Omo Valley sample is much more um, complete. You get nice, um, well-preserved skulls and um, mandibles, which really allowed um, Camille Aramburg, who um, led the Omo expeditions, to um, come up with a revised diagnosis for this um, elephant. And um, as quoted by um, Michel Bedal on the right-hand side of the screen, the various workers took the Omo Rekai as typical, and on some occasions, the older form, which incidentally were the first discovered as the others. So um, you have this discrepancy as to um, how Rekai should be defined. And later researchers in the um, post-World War II period sort of willy-nilly and started calling everything, everything, every fossil that's elephanty you find in East Africa, Rekai, which gives you problems. And so um, the compromise solution that Michel Bedon came up with during his um, PhD working on these elephants was to um, subdivide um, Rekai into this single long lasting lineage into five successive chrono subspecies that show a number of progressive evolutionary trends in the um, dentition, such as the increase in the number of lamellae, greater hypsodonty, and um, reduced enamel thickness so that the individual teeth can pack in more um, shearing lamellae for um, eating the um, tougher, grassier vegetation that was becoming more and more prevailing in um, East Africa at the time as the um, savanna ecosystem that we're familiar with takes, took shape, or at least so goes the theory. And so Bedal's work was based on this excellent sequence of um, fossil elephant dental materials known from the um, Omo Valley, um, very well dated um, radiometrically stretching from the um, late Pliocene sediments at the bottom all the way to the um, sort of middle Pleistocene, about half a million years old at the top. And so almost is, as you can see in Southwestern Ethiopia, this is the river that supplies the um, huge late Kana in um, Northern Kenya. And so gives rise to the Takana Basin where you find all these very celebrated early hominin remains like Paranthropus, like the um, Nario Katome boy, which is, um, which is a famous um, specimen of Homo ergaster or early Homo erectus. Anyways, back to elephants. So this was the prevailing standard model um, since Maglio's monograph was um, published. And um, it, it, does anybody have any comments to add at this point? I was just looking at that last slide, Stephen, and you no, know, I, I think about these things, and there's all these localities. One of the fascinating things that I always find 
with uh, African proboscideans is that, you know, there's these great localities that have lots of hominid material. And that's what yep. you always hear about. But looking at this, not only do we have, you know, do, not only do we have a little bit of, of, of proboscidean material, elephant material, but we've got a lot. You know, you can actually get at these, these, uh, these trends through time. And I, I just can't... trends through time. This is a, oh, this okay. is a whole complicated story. I <laughs> got it. You're going to get to that part, huh? <laughs> yep, I'm, I'm going to get to that part very soon. Good, good. So, um, as Chris has just mentioned, the um, prevailing view for the last few decades was that you can subdivide elephants into these um, successive structural stages that um, became more evolutionarily progressive, if you like, over time. And the classic example of that is the elephas reci complex, which is believed to be um, closely related to um, the ancestor of the modern Asian elephant and later give rise to Paleoloxodon. But in the 90s, people began to um, reevaluate these hypotheses a little bit more analytically. And so um, Nancy Todd in his um, PhD thesis undertook the first um, detailed cladistic analysis of um, ancient elephant interrelationships. And um, what she found was that um, once you undertake the character analysis, the, um, the traditional idea of the successive Eliphas Rekai lineage that leads from um, an archetypal type of Eliphas to Paleoloxodon breaks down completely. And so clearly we have some problems here as um, illustrated by one of um, Nancy's papers that I took this picture from. You can see there's um, rampant homoplasy of the um, dental morphologies in elephant evolution. So um, an obvious conclusion we can get from here is perhaps that we need to look elsewhere. And um, later on that, um, that picture is further complicated by results from ancient DNA obtained from European Paleoloxodon, which suggests that um, instead of deriving from um, archetypal elephas in Africa, Loxodont Loxodonta is actually the closest living relative of Paleoloxodon, which um, having diverged from the ancestor it shared with the living African elephant species, then received um, genetic contribution from introgressions with an ancestor of the mammoth and an ancestor of the forest elephant. Very complicated ancestry. Stephen, I'll jump in with a question. Cool. This is something that's come up a few times for us, and that is sort of how we get these dramatically different views based on sort of traditional morphology of teeth versus the genetic work. And your thoughts on that, sort of moving forward in the world of paleontology, what do we need to do? Look away from teeth. <laughs> yeah. Teeth are taxonomically and gradistically great, but um, they're, they're, so, they're so correlated with functions. I'm, I'm, um, I'm not surprised by the um, amount of homoplasy that's going on once you understand the evolutionary context of these beasts. Excellent. And so, um, as I said, we need to look elsewhere and um, during my PhD, I have been fortunate enough to examine firsthand um, these excellently preserved skulls that were referred to the Rekai complex by previous authors. You get the um, you get this Elephas Rekai brumti, which is the primitive Pliocene chrono subspecies, if you like, from the Omo Valley in Ethiopia. You get the slightly younger early Pleistocene. Eliphas Rekai Atavus, this um, beautiful skull from um, the Takana Basin, and um, going further towards more recent geological times, you get the um, this skull from the Afar Depression in central northern Ethiopia, referred to the nominotypical Rekai, which is dated to about a million years old. So um, throw them so look at their morphologies closely, record the um, different osteological characters and throw these in, 
into a cladistic analysis with a bunch of other fossil elephants I've looked at from all over the world. That was the aim of the game. This is um, this slide is just to show you roughly where um, each key specimen came from. And, and so um, this is roughly the uh, result I came up with. The um, Rekai complex breaks down completely as did um, Nancy Todd found out, but this time um, inferred from skull morphology, not just dental morphology, which is a lot more reliable for um, reconstructing phylogeny than characters of isolated teeth. So um, we have the Loxodonta lineage um, here, and then we have um, Paleoloxodon reci, the nominal typical form, forming a cluster with Eurasian Paleoloxodon, but away from um, its supposed ancestor, um, the Brunktai, which um, clusters together with this um, previously unrecognized lineage of um, elephants known from across Afro-Eurasia, which um, the, the best uh, applicable name is Phanagoraloxodon. And um, then you get the classic um, Mamuthus elephas clade with um, elephas adivus forming um, a cluster with the Asian lineage that led to the modern Asian elephant, including the early Pleistocene species Elephas hysudricus from the um, from the northern Indian subcontinent, and of course our old friends the mammoths. And so, from this um, from this new phylogenetic hypothesis of elephants, um, we were able to deduce um, the pattern of elephant dispersal out of Africa once the um, early radiation phases took place. And for um, for the remainder of this talk, our focus is Paleoloxodon. So um, by about 1 million years ago, you have the nominal typical Paleoloxodon reci in East Africa that is more or less recognizable as a Paleoloxodon. I'll talk about why later. And then slightly later, right at the very beginning of the early Middle Pleistocene, we see Paleoloxodon reci dispersing into the Levant with this um, represented by this skull from the um, Geshe Benot Yaakov Paleolithic site in Israel. Around the same time, we start to pick up the earliest um, occurrences in Europe and Central Asia with um, Paleoloxodon Antiquus from Slivia in Italy. And also um, this um, slightly unknown um, species Paleoloxodon Turkmenicus from Central Asia, first found in Turkmenistan. That's how it got its name. And also we got around this time, we pick up the first uh, occurrence of Paleoloxodon in India as well in the form of um, Paleoloxodon nomadicus. And then by half a million years ago, either through Central China or through the um, all through the southern parts of the Japanese archipelago, which was connected to the um, what is now the island of Taiwan, because of the lower sea levels during the Ice Age, Paleoloxodon reached Japan. And so um, the most remarkable feature of um, Paleoloxodon. Paleoloxodon that, in my opinion, defines this clade is the um, crest at the top of the skull roof that's um, jutting forward called the parietal occipital crest because of um, work I've done with uh, Marco Ferretti and um, others, which has shown that um, this crest actually derives from a forward bending of the nuchal surface where the neck muscle attaches to the back of the skull. This is different from the um, Eliphaz lineage, which sometimes shows the same, um, shows a similar pattern of the um, skull roof jutting forward. But um, my opinion is that in Eliphaz, the Asian elephant lineage, this, is, um, this results directly from the parietal occipital bossing at the top of the skull roof and not so much a bending forward of the nuchal surface. And so we have some variabilities of um, this 
feature that for a long time has caused confusions with the um, with our taxonomy of um, Paleoloxodon. You get um, one variety with a very poorly developed um, parietal occipital crest, and then you have some specimens that have a sort of um, you have the um, you have the crest at the, at the top of the skull jutting forward a bit more prominently. Um, just to reassure you, this um, the distribution pattern of this morph has nothing to do with 20th century global politics. Um, this is found in India as well. And finally, we get the um, specimens with really strongly developed parietal occipital crests known from India, China, Germany, and Italy. So for a long time, this has caused controversies in our um, delimitation of Paleoloxodon taxonomy because um, one of the um, prevailing opinions since the days of Henry Fairfield Osborne was that um, Europe, European and Japanese species are marked by um, weak parietal occipital crest and the Indian ones, Nomadicus, was marked by a strong parietal occipital crest. And then these, um, these specimens with really well-developed parietal occipital crest started popping up in Germany and Italy, which is what led Maglio to believe that um, Paleoloxodon and Tychus of Europe was really one species with Nomadicus. However, from um, from a really spectacular site on the island of Sicily called Pontali Cave, where a large number of a dwarfed species of Paleoloxodon has been discovered, lots of different um, lots of different skull remains. This is one of the best single site samples for studying Paleoloxodon morphology. From the Pontali Cave sample, we can see that really in um, in the, species, in the species that end up developing really, really strong um, parietal occipital crest when the animal reaches full maturity, this is, uh, this is really an ontogenetic process. You get, um, you get um, specimens with the penultimate molars in place with um, rather more attenuated development of the crest. And then you have um, M3 stage specimens where the last molars are in place. Um, these are older animals suggesting. So, so these, these older animals had really, really well developed parietal occipital crests. And this is the same pattern we see in um, with the Indian Paleoloxodon the Manica samples, um, slightly more attenuated development of the crest in the juvenile and really, really prominent crest in this um, adult female skull. Blaine, got, got any comments? Yeah, how does this relate to then sort of the weight and length of the tusks, this morphology that you're, different morphologies that you're seeing in the cranium? So I'll, 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 I'll come to this in just a sec. Perfect. Right, so what about um, the supposed um, examples of individual variability in European Paleoloxodon and Tyquus? Well, um, there were some um, purported specimens um, in the early 20th century found across Europe that suggests a weakly developed parietal occipital crest, but um, these turn out to actually be reconstructed, especially what, um, what happened to this beautiful skull from Pianataro Interamna in Italy. It's a bit um, tragic. A local farmer attempted to excavate the skull from his plot of land and um, ended up damaging the skull roof irreparably. So um, when the specimen was transported to the American Museum of Natural History, it was heavily reconstructed. We don't know the original morphology of the skull. And um, same with the um, specimens from Steinheim in Germany that um, Osborne believed to be the um, weak crested morph, which turns out the skull roof is also substantially restructed, reconstructed, sorry. And so what we have left are these, um, are these specimens with quite prominent um, parietal occipital crest in, 
Italy, you have this one in um, Neumark Nord in Germany, but I think this is a result of pathology. You can see this really notable injury on the forehead and sign of healing suggests that the um, animal might have survived um, a decade or so with that injury, can only be caused from a confrontation with another straight tusked elephant, but anyhow, um, prevented this poor creature from developing that really spectacular crest. And so Blaine talked about how this relates to um, the size of the animal and the size of the tusks. And um, the, answer, the answer we hypothesized with in a paper I worked on with Asia Laramendi that was published last year was that um, This structure developed as an attachment site for extra neck muscle to support the extra large head and, and the huge tusks of um, adult Paleoloxodon. These are the largest skulls you have of um, any elephant ever. You can, from the um, peak of the skull roof all the way to the base of the tusk sheets, it can be over four and a half feet tall. So just imagine the size of the elephant. And so um, we hypothesized there's an allometric effect of um, the development of the cranial crest that is to do with um, body size. Blaine, have you got? Well, I saw Chris talking, but he's <laughs> on mute. So, yeah, I, 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 I didn't unmute myself, but <laughs> I, Stephen, I, I just wanted to ask a quick question. As you're kind oh. of talking about the skull roof stuff, you know, your your talk is fascinating because, in part, because I so rarely see so many complete skulls or relatively complete skulls, uh, and I'm wondering if that's kind of my my bias, you know, working with mammoths and mastodons and thinking about, you know, are there differences in kind of pneumatization? It, they, they, those kinds of skulls just aren't preserved very often in mammoths. Yeah, uh, they're, they're, they're very, very heavily pneumatized as well. This, this, is, this is what we came up with after going through the thankless task of um, checking every museum collection that has a nice paleoloxodon skull. <laughs> These are rare just as rare if not more so than your north american mammoth skulls for for every just, just out, pull it out of your pocket let's see out of every for every complete or nice paleoloxodon skull how many crappy ugly broken up skulls did you have to look at well the, the thing is the, the the ugly broken up ones are not very useful for what we're looking at <laughs> Good point. Good point. <laughs> well, then another comment there that going along with what you were talking about is, you know, when you say they're large, can you give us an image or a feeling for how large these largest ones were compared to modern? And not just skull size, but, you know, overall body size. Overall body size. Um, up there, if not slightly bigger than the biggest Columbia mammoth you can see. Very big animals. I think didn't Asir or Laramendi have a paper that basically said there was one Paleoloxodon that was like the biggest proboscidean. So it wasn't biggest proboscidean. Yes, some, something like that. But it's it's based on the um, distal part of a um, distal part of a femur or femur. a humerus. I can't recall yeah. clearly off the top of my head. But definitely up there. Definitely big. Definitely up there, especially with. Um, Antipus and Nomadicus, which, which um, I, I'd say slightly exceeded the size of the biggest Columbia mammoths. And so with, um, and so having examined the um, ontogeny or growth related pattern of the skull crest development in the European and um, Indian samples, we can conclude that um, there were some other lesser well-known species of Paleoloxodon that represented early offshoots that did not develop um, very prominent parietal occipital crests, like possibly Paleoloxodon tugmenicus from Central Asia and um, 
recently, one of our recent guests, um, Ave Juka, has been working on this excellently preserved um, Paleoloxodon skull from Kashmir, India, that shows the same pattern as the Tegmanicus type skull of the very underdeveloped um, parietal occipital crest. So we look forward to seeing what um, Atve has got to say, and this can potentially substantiate Tegmanicus as um, a bona fide, if not poorly known species. And you've also got Paleoloxodon nomini from Japan. This is an M3 individual with its last molar. So um, we can say with a certain amount of confidence, this is another bona fide species um, that has a weakly developed parietal occipital crest. Yet still, we have some further mysteries about um, Paleoloxodon originally from my neck of the woods, because from northern China in the Nihuan Basin, we have this um, nomadicus morph um, Paleoloxodon with really well-developed um, parietal occipital crest, but we have few other well-dated um, remains of Paleoloxodon from northern China, but from the um, Penghu Channel of the um, southwest coast of Taiwan, you get dredged huge numbers of um, Paleoloxodon remains, just as gigantic as um, those in Europe. But unfortunately, we don't have a skull roof preserved of these beasts. So at the moment, we don't know if um, this, this Paleoloxodon population called Paleoloxodon huaihoensis, known from central China and Taiwan, whether it belongs to the um, type from northern China with a really well-developed parietal occipital crest, or whether it actually was more closely related to the Japanese population with a more attenuated development of the crest. And so um, setting the issue of who's who in Paleoloxodon aside for now, which I'm sure has um, a lot of fantastic stories still to be told. Um, we're going to focus a little bit on the paleoecology of um, Paleoloxodon. So um, Adrian talked about mammoths uh, a while ago. So um, unlike mammoths, which showed um, stepwise progressive evolution of dental morphology as they dispersed out of Eurasia, sorry, out of Africa and into Eurasia, um, Paleoloxodon shows a pretty conservative dental morphology. The, um, ad the advanced type of um, Paleoloxodon teeth with um, up to 20 enamel ridges um, closely aligned with one another was already well developed in Paleoloxodon reci from the late early Pleistocene of East Africa. And um, this as um, work by Juha Saarinen has shown uh, measuring the uh, mesal wear relief angles of these teeth indeed suggests that this was an um, adaptation for increasing amount of tough graze in the diet and also from ingesting lots of dirt and dust which wear away your teeth. However, once these um, paleoloxodon got into Europe, we see a slightly different picture because in Europe, paleoloxodon encountered another type of specialist grazing elephant, the mammoth, which were already well developed to the um, burgeoning mammoth steppe ecosystem of northern Eurasia. So um, in order to avoid competition and achieve niche partition, what um, Paleoloxodon has done is to um, switch to a browsing slash mixed feeding diet instead, as we can see from the um, more acute mesoware angle of um, the um, Paleoloxodon from East Anglia compared with that of um, mammoths from the, um, from the same area. And so another aspect of Paleoloxodon that might intrigue certain people is um, how they interacted with uh, early humans. Now that we've known um, some of the purported early Paleoloxodon remains are found in the same um, fossil faunas as that of early hominins. Well, um, we, we know with a um, fair amount of confidence that our early ancestors probably liked to have um, 
Paleoloxodon for a barbecue on a Friday afternoon, as known from the um, Paleoloxodon butcher site at um, the, at Ologosaili in Kenya, and also from um, Geshe Benot Yaakov in Israel, where this Paleoloxodon rekai skull was found alongside some Paleolithic stone tools. And um, this led to people such as um, Todd Surarel to suspect this was a prolonged process of proboscidean overkill by archaic hominins that eventually drove the um, extinction of, um, ele of elephant-like giants from all across the globe, um, mammoths, paleoloxodon, the lot. So um, what does the extinction chronology of paleoloxodon say about the last remaining paleoloxodon? So, um, in Europe, we pick up the um, last Paleoloxodon uh, between 50 and um, 34,000 years ago, although this is from, um, this is slightly dated now from um, Tony Stewart back in 2005. Um, I, 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 I'd, I'd eagerly anticipate more resolved and more robust um, later dates for European Paleoloxodon. We had, um, African Paleoloxodon jolensis, the direct descendants of Paleoloxodon rekai, which remained in Africa, those became extinct around 35,000 years ago. And then the um, last Japanese Paleoloxodon naumanai is known to occur around the time of the last glacial maximum, as reported by Iwase et al. back in 2012. And um, Advait, one of our recent guests, um, has suggested that um, Paleoloxodon nomadicus survived into the very late Pleistocene in India. And um, based on the similar late Pleistocene age of that uh, Chinese Paleoloxodon skull in Nihuan Basin I just showed you, I would suspect a similar extinction timing for the last Paleoloxodon in the Far East. And um, actually, in Europe, Paleoloxodon shows a very um, interesting pattern of occurrence with mammoths. You, get, you obviously have the um, alternating glacial and interglacial phases. And from the record, we would see the same pattern of um, mammoth and Paleoloxodon turnover. So mammoths would be dominant in an area during the glacial phase and Paleoloxodon will be dominant during the interglacial phase. Although you always find some cases of coexistence between the two elephants, as you do with um, a, a, a sample of fossil elephants from Ilford, just north of London. But um, over the millennia, these um, clim these continuous interglacial glacial perturbations across Eurasia would probably have um, done a lot to um, obliterate the metapopulational structure of um, Paleoloxodon and make them vulnerable to um, sudden black swan occurrences like um, the occurrence of a new predator such as Homo sapiens. And more recently, we've um, had purported cases of Holocene survival of Paleoloxodon radiocarbon dated to just around 3,000 years ago, which is um, sort of extraordinary. That this is this is well into the um, times of the ancient um, ancient Chinese civilization. So Li et al judged um, the presence of two finger-like structures at the end of this um, ancient Chinese elephant carving to suspect that, um, pa that Paleoloxodon might have been depicted because of how the modern Asian elephant only has one finger-like structure at um, the tip of its trunk. Having said that, um, Sam Turvey et al. more recently um, took um, cutting edge radiocarbon dating of the purported Holocene Paleoloxodon tooth from China. Irrespective of whether it's a Paleoloxodon or an Asian elephant, which has a very similar dental morphology to Paleoloxodon, and sometimes you get those two confused in paleontological and zooarchaeological settings, the tooth is over 50,000 years old. So it is not a Holocene 
paleoloxodon from China, but the jury is very much still out. And so to um, summarize everything I've talked about so far, paleoloxodon evolved in East Africa by one million years ago and um, actually evolved from quite a divergent lineage from that related to the modern day Asian elephant. So sometimes people may see in the literature paleoloxodon synonymized with elephas in the literature. I, I think that's no longer justified based on um, based on other people's work that have came out in the last um, decade or so, and also my own um, research that I did over my PhD. And so there were other stuff from that red high wastebasket that should no longer be considered part of Paleoloxodon's ancestry. The most prominent feature of Paleoloxodon, apart from its massive size and its massive head, is that, um, prominent parietal occipital crest jutting forward. And um, that has ontogenetic variability, but um, that has ontogenetic, that has ontogenetic variability that has to be taken into consideration when um, doing paleoloxodon taxonomy. And um, much remains to be found out about the relative roles of um, climate and um, early human impacts on the eventual extinction of Paleoloxodon. And um, on that note, I say thank you very much for joining me this afternoon. All right, thank you very much, Stephen. I know we have a, a number of questions coming in. Go for it. <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in with one first here, and that is just, you talked about the uh, ontogenetic potential and differences. But what about sexual dimorphism? Is that a feature that we also need to be thinking about here? Definitely. So um, Advait, who, um, Advait just sent me this um, beautiful Paleoloxodon nomadicus skull that uh, I'll have to share a screen. Because I'll have to share a screen and show you. <laughs> right. Maybe what? While you're pulling that up, um, I, I, it kind of leads into my question too, which is looking at that great reconstruction that you can have. You, you have can you two. see Advay next to the Paleoloxodon skull now? <laughs> <laughs> He's not so, short either. <laughs> He's not short either, exactly. So this is the, um, this is the um, skull of a male Paleoloxodon nematicus found in the um, Godavari alluvium of central India which has much more prominent parietal occipital crest than the um, female skull in the Natural History Museum that I showed you during my slides. Fascinating. So sexual dimorphism is definitely um, something we need to take into consideration. Also, don't forget in modern elephants, males are much bigger than females. And the same case is likely to be true for Paleoloxodon. Bigger males, bigger heads, um, requiring stronger site of muscle attachment, mm -hmm. more prominent parietal occipital crest. To what degree do you think that has influenced different species names in the past? So well, I, I calling think, the more robust I think ones we've made something a, else. I think we've made a pretty good case for the um, state of the art in paleoloxodon taxonomy in that um, paper I worked on with Asi Laramendi, Marco Ferretti, and um, Maria Rita Palombo, but definitely in the past, um, it has caused um, confusion because um, people were either too typological or um, you get lumpers like Maglio who, um, who um, preferred to um, keep everything into, uh, into as few species as possible, if you like. I did see one question here from Greg McDonald that I'll go ahead and Perfect. ask him. Uh, with the most extreme development of the parietal occipital crest, do you see a more robust development of the atlas, axis, and other cervicals for the nuchal ligament? Well, um, I'm, af I'm afraid to say I'm not an expert on um, postcranial morphology, but uh, I, uh, I, I'd welcome um, Greg to remind me of this um, question if he drops me an email, because this is definitely a hypothesis to test in the future if um, available data doesn't point the question in any direction already. 
And that one was on Facebook, so you guys can follow up on no, that definitely. one. David, David, you want to jump in, and Chris, too? Go ahead. Why don't we do some from the, the crowd, David? Sure. We've got a bunch of questions coming in from our audience. Uh, Jenny has asked, have there been findings of hominin predation on paleoloxodons in Africa? Well, you get several butcher sites that are dated from the um, late early to the middle Pleistocene. So that's about 1 million to um, 0.5 million years ago. We know from ample paleoanthropological evidence that meat had meat from big animals had became an important part of um, human substance and strategy at that point. But I'm not entirely convinced that um, I'm not entirely convinced that um, humans at that time, with their um, with the with their um, hunting strategies and technologies, were um, specialist um, elephant predators, especially given how huge these things were. And also from um, from the very cursory look at the literature on those um, African butcher sites, myself, I'm. I'm not convinced those were kill sites. Uh, that, that, does, that doesn't mean humans weren't killing paleoloxodon. I'm just um, saying based on those sites, it, um, I'm not fully convinced that humans were killing paleoloxodon at those particular sites. May have been scavenging. Yep. Gotcha. And then uh, I'll go with one more. Speaking of uh, how these animals coexisted with others, Martin asked, what do you imagine niche partitioning was like for Paleoloxodon and the other proboscideans that coexisted with it? So um, we go back to Yuha's um, work here on the um, mesoware angle measurement of um, mammoth and Paleoloxodon teeth based on sites in England. So um, in case you missed my earlier talk, the um, more obtuse more obtuse or grazed at the mesoware angle, the more grass there was in the diet. So um, in Africa, all the elephants were more or less eating grass. But once um, Paleoloxodon got into Europe, it encountered um, mammoths that had already become specialist grazing elephants in the European ecosystem because they got to Europe at least um, two million years before Paleoloxodon did. So in order to achieve niche partition, you can see where my cursor is um, pointing. Paleoloxodon in Europe sometimes had lower mesoware relief angles, suggesting they were browsers to mix feeders to be able to um, avoid competition with mammoths. I All hope right. that answers the question a little bit. <laughs> Chris, did you have something you wanted to ask? I, I was just marveling at the the, the clean data. <laughs> As a person who, who tr struggles to, to make sense of stable isotopes sometimes and the noise that you get, having something that is actually interpretable and saying, try oh, mesoware. Yeah, maybe I need to I need to branch out. <laughs> All right, here's another question. This one is from Dick, who asks, uh, do you find Hi, different do you find differences in the postcranial skeleton that indicates different locomotion in Antiquus versus others? We're not too sure about that. And um, by the way, thanks for um, th thanks, Dick, for um, sending those um, measurements of um, Paleoloxodon and Tigris postcranials to ASIA, which um, made an important part of our paper in. Um, the differences between Nomadicus and Antiquus. Um, Antiquus seems to have more robust postcranial skeletons compared to the more gracile postcranial remains of Nomadicus in India. So that's another that's another consistent difference we found that allowed us to substantiate Antiquus and Nomadicus as two different species. But uh, unfortunately, I can't um, answer the question about locomotion. All right, and then we've got 
A uh, question from Dario, who asks about the last occurrences of E. Rekai in Africa. So the last occurrence of E. Rekai in Africa, um, probably about 200,000 years ago in South Africa, I would say. There's um, stuff you might have read upon that in the literature has been called Loxodonta Atlantica Zulu that, in my opinion, are actually late South African Paleoloxodon Rekai. That, that's, that's just, um, that's just um, my current working hypotheses, having seen the um, published data and um, photographs of specimens. Um, it's, it's an idea that I'd like to test further by studying the specimens firsthand. So, um, it, so that, that's my hunch at the moment, but it, at the moment it's not a hill I want to die on given the um, current evidence. All right. Well, we better start wrapping it up here. Uh, I think Chris has sort of a final uh, question. David, do you have any right before that you want to ask? Uh, go right ahead, Chris. All right. Well, so Stephen, my, my question is you've traveled the world looking at these collections. I mean, you've put a lot of miles. You've flown a lot of miles. You traveled a lot of miles. You've seen a lot of skulls. As a proboscidean person, as a person who studies elephants, we're embedded. We get used to these collections and these specimens, uh, unlike people who study smaller things sometimes. You know, we're climbing around, shelving, and there's always access issues. And, you know, nobody's Definitely. looked at this thing. Yeah, there's always, they're always mounted. You know, it's given all the things that you've looked at, do you have a favorite paleoloxodon? Uh, mm -hmm. that you that you really like because it was just kind of turned on a light bulb and, and changed how you thought about something? Or is there one that just had more personality than others or what? I don't have a favorite paleoloxodon. But, uh, like I, like I, a I, good I, parent. <laughs> <laughs> you don't I, have don't, a favorite. I don't have a favorite paleoloxodon, but um, I, I'm, I'm, um, I'm very happy to be able to just... Um, assert the, um, to clarify the um, phylogenetic position of the nominal typical Paleoloxodon reci in East Africa as the ancestral Paleoloxodon and um, not, not, not something that's directly related to the Eliphaz lineage. Got it. That, that's yeah, a that's fascinating a, this, this part is, of this. This is something that bugs me quite <laughs> a bit when um, people when I see people attempting to um, illustrate Paleoloxodon reci in the um, ancient East African landscape, when most of the time what they're depicting is actually Eliphas Atavus, which, um, as I said in my talk, is one of the presumed ancestors of early Paleoloxodon. But um, actually, as my phylogenetic analysis has um, turned out, it's um, it's not quite that way. I'm just going to share a screen again. So this black and white skull that's next to the Asian elephant is um, Eliphas atavus, which was thought to be um, an ancestor of Paleoloxodon. But you can, you can see how distant it is from the actual Paleoloxodon lineage. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's your favorite one. <laughs> <laughs> Don't put word in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we better wrap it up there. But thank you so much. I learned a lot thank today. Thank you for inviting me. Yes. And please stay on with us for just a little bit after we finish the show. Oh, definitely. So my pleasure. Before, before we wrap up, I will say that we've got a few questions that we didn't get to answer. And I know, Stephen, that you enjoy answering these questions in the comments. So feel free to go through the comments of this uh, video afterwards if you want to address some of those. Uh, thanks to everyone who did ask questions. And Blaine, do we want to uh, mention what's happening in the future? Yes, so we will not be meeting next week. So Paleo Talks is canceled next week as we move into our Memorial Day weekend. But the following week on June 4th, we will be back with Megan Weatherell and we'll be talking about Oreodonts for the first time, which is exciting and definitely needed. So a bit of a quantum leap from Perbisidians. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again, Stephen. We'll see you. My pleasure.
Thank you, Stephen. Thank you.